Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Stills Gallery. I'm here mainly this evening to welcome to Edinburgh um, for the first time in 10 years, I think, a <laughs> uh, photographer called Martin Parr. So many of you will have heard of Martin must be one of the most exhibited and indeed one of the most published photographers uh, working in Britain. You know, I invited him up. He's very keen to talk on the subject of documentary photography, asset or liability. Martin? Thank you. I think the first thing I should say is that um, some of the things I'll be discussing tonight aren't exactly clearly um, thought out in my head because um, over the last few years I've been examining quite closely the whole nature of documentary and the whole way in which in this country in particular we're involved with it. And some of these ideas really are in the state of uh, evolution. So it's not like I'm going to be handing you a definite thesis or theory. What I'm hoping to do really is to try and put up some ideas, look at some of the work that I think is interesting at the moment within this sphere, and also look quite closely at my own development because I think there I can best illustrate how my thoughts have changed over the last 10 years since I was last in Edinburgh. And it's really the, the way in which I can see things changing for myself and as I uh, grow older I can see things quite differently that I really want to focus on most of all. So forgive me first off if um, some of it may seem like sort of ramblings from a a confused mind, because to a certain extent there is the, you know, there is an element of that. But hopefully it will give you some ideas <coughs> of what I'm trying to sort of investigate myself. Uh, a lot of people ask me whether they're in photography or not. What kind of photographer are you? And up to about two or three years ago, I always used to say documentary photographer. And now I actually try and avoid saying that. Because sometimes if you meet someone in a train, for example, you don't know them from Adam. I'd probably just say I'm a documentary photographer because it's the easiest thing to explain. But if I met someone, you know, like a student of photography or another photographer, and they would ask me what kind of photographer I am, I would probably say I'm not a documentary photographer. And you may think this is very peculiar because on the surface, the work that you may have seen of mine looks very much within the documentary mold. But I'm actually trying quite specifically to make a point of actually saying that stop, I think what we've actually taken for granted for quite a long time in this country needs to be re-examined. And I personally don't find myself fitting into the conventions that rule our actual sort of, you know, what we think of in terms of being documentary photography. So that really is in one sense the, the theme that I want to illustrate tonight. So if we turn off the lights, we shall start. In any medium, it, it's actually ruled by various conventions, and I think photography is a particular case in point. For example, if I to show you these photographs here, which are from a book produced in the 30s called The World's Greatest Photographs, most of you would have no problem sort of dismissing them as being a particular type of photography. You'd say, oh, this is pictorial-based, um, romantic work that you still see evidence of in things like camera clubs. You know, you can quite clearly place it. And you know, I'd agree with this, uh, you know, that, that sort of general thesis on that type of work. What I'm trying to say is that most of the documentary photography we see in this country also is based on similar sort of conventions, except the conventions are less obvious than perhaps you see in this kind of work. But they are nonetheless there, and to actually try and get away from that is extremely difficult. exceptional photographer, and we also know about how Britain in the uh, Victorian era produced some very great photographic talent, and how as we came to the 20th century, uh, it seemed to evaporate, and with the exception of Bill Brandt, there wasn't really much interesting activity in photography until, say, the, uh, the 70s, when what's known now as the Renaissance in photography started. That's not to say that there wasn't a lot of photography going on. But the photography from that time, I think, actually has its roots in what's actually gone on today. And that is basically, it came from the magazines, it came from things like Picture Post, uh, and it was all based on sort of humanism, the whole notion that you use photography to celebrate um, mankind and man. 
And in order to do that, because as you know, man is not altogether, you know, always deserves some celebration, you actually have to sort of hide your sort of self behind a set of conventions and a set of sort of cliche views of people. And if you can look at various things within that sort of viewpoint, you have people looking at noble working class people, you have uh, people looking at uh, very isolated rural communities. There's various sort of set things that you can see become more established. The day in the life of mentality, where the whole idea is that you describe a narrative within photography rather than actually thinking about your own particular personal way of looking at things. So I won't, I don't really actually want to sort of uh, deal in negative things tonight, so I'm much more interested in dealing with positive things. So I'm actually not going to try and illustrate too much the things that I don't like. Suffice to say though that I think, say, Tony Ray Jones, when he started shooting in the late 60s, was probably the first person to go some way towards breaking down this sort of accepted notion of humanism and the cliche-ridden view of the world. And it's interesting that he studied photography over in America, where there's no doubt about it, where England and Britain have, relate, have lied very dormant in terms of photographic development. The ball had actually gone over, uh, it was actually here in the Victorian times in, in Britain, but it had actually gone over to America where it's been developed. And I think, um, as you know, there are many fine photographers that came out of the 30s, 40s, 50s, I don't need to go into the names, and I think it's quite relevant that someone like Tony Ray Jones went over to America, studied with someone called Alexey Brodovich, who is a very fine photography lecturer and teacher, came back to England and suddenly realized what not, you know, what hadn't been photographed, and went to set to task, even though was, uh, he dealt with things that were so obvious that it hurts, like the seaside, like British customs, British sort of... Uh, sort of uh, those kind of events that you so much associate with this kind of photography, he nonetheless was able to throw some very good photographs, new photographs, on these sort of old, tired subjects. And out of that same sort of renaissance, other people started to emerge as perhaps having more to offer than perhaps the previous generation of photojournalists. So very much still, photojournalists who maybe would do their own work, even Barry is a classic example of that, and to a certain extent, I think this work that came out of the early Renaissance also is very weak in one sense, because it inherited those problems, but it did give it a slight new edge to it that had very much come from the influence that we'd seen from America. But only a slight one. It was still very much uh, deeply rooted in the European humanism movement. Thank you, Pern. Homer Sykes. Classic subjects for people to look at within, say, photojournalistic documentary mold. Steele Perkins. James Davilius. This is quite similar, really, to the numerous people who, um, if you were to look at, say, how Scotland is represented by documentary photography in the last 15 years, the books that spring to mind are all things done on, uh, you know, the Hebrides, the Orkneys, all the sort of Celtic fringes of Scotland. Actually, when you come, to, say, even just coming in on the train to Edinburgh today and looking around Edinburgh, you feel what you actually see and experience, you know, just me and my sort of one day trip here has been entirely unphotographed by Scottish photographers. And I think that's a classic illustration of how photographers tend to go. I imagine that mostly a lot of these photographers who live in Edinburgh and Glasgow and then they think, ah, oh, it's time to photograph, I must catch, you know, the train out to the or the bus or drive out to some sort of Celtic island where rural life still goes on, the values of humanism are still there, and that's what they end up photographing. And if one was to think of how Scotland represented, I think it's a very good example of how weak this whole movement is. The nobility of work is another classic subject that people explore. And then of course you have 
a lot of people, including myself, um, you know, do the English quirky sort of idea and scene, and you find one sort of idea and you pick up on it and you reproduce it many times, and that's a very effective way that photography works, and it often produces uh, some very good work because of that. This is a very good example of that. But I think Keith Arnett is quite an interesting photographer. And it's interesting to note he came from a fine art background and drifted into photography rather than from an actual photographic background. So let me look now at a few people who I think have um, perhaps to some extent <coughs> made some progress in this sort of uh, trying to evolve the way that this kind of photography has worked. This is someone called Brian Griffin, who I gather will be later contributing to this series of talks. And he started out originally around the notion of going out to events to, you know, as a photojournalist would operate, but actually coming back with very different type of pictures than what is expected from a photojournalist <coughs> as such. This is one he took in Spain. And uh, you may have seen this book that he produced, I think it was um, in the late 70s or around 1980 called Power, which is a compilation of many of the portraits that he did of um, businessmen and managing people. And it's interesting, and it's quite relevant in fact, that because Brian is a very great innovative photographer, it's very interesting to see the way in which the editorial portrait has actually changed since Brian contributed to it in the late 70s. And I think it's very interesting to look at this current exhibition called 20 for Today, and you can actually feel, in many photographers, the actual influence that Brian has actually had. You could say, well, that's a sub-Griffin. I mean, that's no disrespect to some of the people in the show, but there's very definitely a case where he has actually changed the way in which that particular type of photograph is looked at and perceived. This is one of the pictures from that series. And one of the interesting things about Brian, and one of the things that to me is so significant and important uh, in his whole operation as a photographer, and you'll certainly pick that up when you hear him talk, is that he takes things uh, visually very personally. And I think this whole business of actually getting away from the narrative, getting away from the actual act of description, the actual act of investigating how you can fuse your own personal feelings with a subject, and if that subject just so happens to be also one of the things that's expected to uh, be operating within documentary photography, it's on a dangerous ground. But in his case, he can actually pull it off. And uh, it's that very high injection of person, uh, personality and uh, you know, emotional response to the subject that I think is so important and so crucial and at the moment so missing in so much of what we see in British documentary photography. part of this series on the City of London. He did a series on uh, London at Night, which was based around his paranoia about the whole notion of the bomb going off and leaving this sort of uh, skeleton of a city. And he actually, you know, what he actually does is uses photographic technique that you accumulate if you are a working photographer to actually try and explore and experiment with those sort of very emotional sort of ideas. So here you've got a simple thing of uh, you know, leaving a camera on the tripod at night, but there's more to it than just that. I think also another thing that most photographers don't pay enough attention to is the actual visual effect of certain objects and certain things. People want to try and Put in everything. For example, you're doing, you've been ascribed to do a documentary on a particular subject. It's actually convention that you try and include everything in that subject. Now, I actually think that's dangerous because I think one of the things that photography is very good at is actually the ability for photography to make a choice about something. Therefore, if you think, let's put in everything, I think you actually weaken the argument or weaken the actual uh, statement that you're going to try and actually make. But sometimes, Within this country, it's actually regarded as a great strength, you know, because you're being so fair, because you're including everything. And I think that's a mistake. So I think it's very interesting the way, for example, here, Brian has picked out, you know, the way all those offices have those rubber plants and they give you the creeps. 
You know, it just having that one thing in and actually concentrating on that, and then the classic hands and the tie. And you don't need the face because you've actually, you're saying more by including less. But it's so easy to actually, when you become, you know, when you put your head on the block, to think, well, I must try and include everything because therefore I'm actually doing the subject or the thing itself justice. And I think that's a fundamental error that people make. Another case in point. This is a photographer called Roger Parler, and I wish I had some slides of a recent series he's done called Precious Metals, which his address is the whole problem, the whole political issue in South Africa, but it does so in such a refreshing way because it actually doesn't deal with it directly. It deals with uh, the knock-on effects of various political aspects. And because of that, um, I actually find it much more moving as a political and art statement than I do to the people who actually overtly make those kind of statements. This is from, I'm not even sure what series this is from, but um, this is a work by Roger Palmer. And so is this. This is someone called Mitra Tabrizia, who uh, was one of many people who had been taught photography by uh, Victor Bergen at Polytechnic Central London. And they too would sort of probably go along with a lot of what I'm saying tonight in the sense that they don't like the way that documentary photography in this country comes out either. But they would solve that problem in a very different way. And uh, as you know, they're very uh, full of the whole theory of photography, the whole theory of politics. But a lot of that work I find visually <laughs> not very engaging. And I think this is one of the few series that's actually come out from that school of thought, and it's not only very interesting as a body of work in what it says and does, but also visually very interesting too. And this is a series she did just when she was leaving Polytechnic on a model school in um, London and how they were taught and trained, that kind of thing. And she uses this with quotes from the people, all kinds of things, text, English text, which of course is very crucial part of the way that PCL people uh, think of those things. Since then, her work has got much more difficult to actually uh, come to terms with, and I'm not sure if it's as successful as I think this particular series was, whereby the theory element of it uh, has probably overrided the visual considerations. And I can't get away from the fact that photography should be you know, a visual medium, despite the fact that I often think the addition of words and various other things can actually add to that, but I would not get away from that basics of the criteria. This is Chris Killip, and it's interesting to see how his works developed. This is one of his earlier Isle of Man pictures, which are very much within the Paul Strand uh, portrait sort of mold, very high quality, just direct, gentle, warm, sympathetic portraits of uh, you know old peasants in this case in the Isle of Man. And then he moved eventually up to uh, Newcastle and produced some very interesting work uh, on arrival there. And this, for example, this issue of Creative Camera, I thought was a real turning point in, um, in say, the way documentary photography was being understood in this country. When I saw this issue, I was so excited, I could hardly contain myself. I thought it was really quite exceptional. And I've never seen something perhaps uh, have as much impact as this one set of photographs at that particular time. I think I've, you know, if I see them now, I'm not quite as excited, but I think in terms of the way, you know, in terms of you know, being one step further on, this is a real landmark. And it's interesting also the way Chris Killip and his close friend Graham Smith are also uh, very much, I feel, in this country, uh, misinterpreted as being photographers, because a lot of people feel that because they're dealing with the subject matter that is so often associated with a cliché view that documentary photography can give, that uh, most people sort of associate them with that particular cliché view. But I do actually think that because their work is so personal, and because it actually goes beyond that, it's very good. But it's, it's such a fine line between you know, actually uh, endorsing what you know already and actually showing some fresh light. It's a difficult one to actually really 
discuss fairly, but I personally feel that it is work which is much more uh, stronger than the usual people who come up and deal with, say, working class communities in the north. But it's a very fine line, and it's, I've had many arguments uh, about this whole issue, and, uh, and I cannot really present a very good case that would persuade someone of that. Of that. But I just feel it intuitively inside me that you know, the work is much better than most of what you see done on the working class north. This is from his Seacole series, which actually has a distinct disadvantage because it is such a uh, classically, poetically romantic subject which is one of the weaknesses that photography can actually uh, you know, have, that it's, it makes the argument for presenting this as being uh, you know, over and above that much more difficult, because of inherently the, the subject has many problems attached to it. But nonetheless, I think there's some very fine images within the series. This is a Graham Smith picture. This, by the way, is one of his top sellers, and I also think this illustrates another point that we have many problems with, is that if and when uh, photography like this is presented to a wider public, you very often find that um, you know, the, the public have very bad tastes, and I don't think this is one of Graham's best pictures by any means, but it's probably one that he sells more prints of than any other picture he's got, because it's, uh, it's very sweet and coy, you can see you know, it's a very easy picture, you can imagine it quite easily on someone's wall, like a nice Christmas card or a birthday card. But yet it's one of the most unchallenging and unstimulating photographs he's ever taken. So you have a real problem also uh, of how photographers perceive outside of photographers in this country to a wider audience. And I would generally say that they're not the best judge of photography because they also tend to want their humanistic prejudices confirmed rather than anything that actually challenges. And photography is one of the great things about photography is it does have this ability to challenge our preconceptions of how we perceive and understand things. These are some photographs of from Graham's recent Gyro Corner exhibition. He has a, a caption for this, which is something about I thought I saw Elizabeth Taylor and couple of film stars, uh, because Graham just thought they actually looked like film stars. And you'll actually find, it's one of the interesting things, is the way that photographers caption their work, or if they don't caption, or if they do caption, is quite significant in the way that they want their work to be understood. And for someone like Graham, um, he puts these quite jokey captions underneath, but still people actually sort of take them very seriously. And he, he was telling me of how he saw uh, a photograph in a Canadian magazine that actually literally said that these are the famous film stars in a pub in South Bank. So I mean, whatever you say or do, someone is going to take them quite literally. And that's because everyone associates the whole notion of documentary with the truth. And that again, of course, is one of the main problems with it, because there is no such thing as sort of genuine photographic truth. It just doesn't exist. It's a non-entity. It's all photography. is just naturally subjective. And I'm going to be coming on to that a bit later, but it's just unavoidable, so uh, you know, forget it. But still people think of that as being um, <coughs> something that they should believe. That's gone the other way, no. <laughs> Someone just tilted that big projector. That's it. This is Paul Graham, who's produced a few books. This is from his first book, which is called The A1. And um, what's interesting, or what's particularly significant about that book when it came out, is that it seemed to be the first book on color, using color, that dealt with a sort of documentary kind of idea or subject. Now, Paul is very interesting, because I think he, he very much finds himself on this fine line between what is documentary and what is, say, more personal, sort of fine art view. And uh, I think particularly, I think that's one of the pictures from the Northern Ireland series, which I thought was very strong. This is a very interesting book in terms of this discussion. Here we have a book which deals with the subject. It's usually sort of the concerned photographer. It's uh, the doll office. It's another of the great conventions within documentary. Is if you find a subject that you think uh, deserves attention and uh, you do it in black and white, grainy, 
to a printed answer, but Paul actually here is using colour, so that immediately throws that argument out a bit. But actually, if you read the text that he wrote with the book, he's very much still writing in an old humanistic way, and he's actually saying that he takes these photographs to actually try and change the conditions in the doll office. I think that's a bit, um, it's very difficult to actually, I think, sustain that argument in one sense, because I'm one of these believers that I don't think photographs do ever change the world we live in. I, don't, I would never expect mine to do anything like that. And I wonder whether Paul, even when he's writing about that, whether he actually wants that as well. Um, nonetheless, I think there's some excellent pictures in this book. And some of the best ones for me actually get away from that sort of narrative way of describing a doll office, and he's actually caught the atmosphere of what it must be like spending those hours there. The actual, even things like the tilt of the camera seem to add to that sort of effect. And I think some of them really work very well. This particularly is good, I think. Where he's actually tried to apply his own personal sort of feelings of what it must be like in a doll office, as, as he actually signed on himself, I'm sure, at some point. And he's managed to capture that. But then often, I think, some of the photographs don't work as well, where they're more straightforward description of what you expect to see there. And for me, this is really the sort of crux of my, what I'm trying to say, is the difference between what one is expects to see to what one actually finds when you get there, I think is very important. I think it's one of the things that photography does best, and also one of the things that photography can do very badly. It's one of the weaknesses and strengths of the medium. And this is what I mean, really, when I say that as you find out more about how the medium operates, you can actually use its strengths and get away from its weaknesses. And that is, I suppose, one thing I'm becoming very conscious of myself. I don't like this, these later photographs as I do the first ones, because I don't think they're quite as evocative of what it actually must have been like to be there. And I'm, I'm interested in photographs that you know, give some kind of feeling of that, that sort of attitude and of, of the time of place and the emotions that we evolved from it. This is from his Troubled Land series of work, which deals with uh, Northern Ireland, and looking at the, uh, the sort of topography of Northern Ireland, how it illustrates the political uh, conflict that goes on there. This is someone called Anna Fox. Uh, this is a series of work she did on basing smoke, which I thought was very effective. It's interesting to see also how um, looking at the less romanticized aspects of our society has suddenly become more into the forefront, which I think is a healthy sign. And Basing Soap certainly is that. <coughs> not exactly the sort of thing you want to uh, you know, remember about Britain, but it's actually you know, so much of Britain is like Basing Soap now, it's been taken over by the new towns, new developments. So I think it's very good that people are starting to look away from the Celtic fringe kind of work that I spoke about earlier. She's also added quotes, I don't know if you can read that. I, for one, am glad I moved to Basingstoke, it's a great place. Letter to Basingstoke, Gazette, 14 I also find it encouraging that people are using colour now and without actually making too much of an issue of it. I mean, I think one of the dangerous things is because um, it's only in the last 10 years that, say, color photography has been taken seriously, first off in America and then naturally over here, I think it's going to be dangerous that we make too much of an issue about color. I mean, I think uh, we're going to see a whole spate of people doing British color photography shows and people are going to say, it's color this, that, and the other. And for me, for example, when I changed from black and white to color, it seemed like a very natural thing, just a, a, a progression, especially if you're trying to sort of pick up on the, how you relate to the world. It seemed like color was a natural you know, tool that one should use. Basingstoke is creating a wealth, and wealth pays for our social dreams. Office worker. Quick look at uh, photographer called John Davis, who originally was a landscape photographer and now, for want of a better expression, is a, a new topographic photographer. 
And again, it's interesting to note that phrase because I'm sure it's one which any of you know much about, so of you be familiar with. But it's all very much part and parcel of the way that people want photographers to be categorized. Like suddenly in America, someone dreams up this exhibition called the New Topographics, and everyone is either a new topographics photographer or they're not. And I think, again, these sort of compartments people have, including documentary photography, are in themselves quite dangerous. And it's one, you know, here am I actually endorsing it by saying, by trying to explain to you what type of photographer John is. And I find it all very funny that, uh, you know, I'm actually using the very tools that I'm trying to sort of examine and break down to endorse the system, if you like. I can't get away from it. I mean, it's a very fine landscape photographer. I think <coughs> they were able to conjure up such a strong feeling of the place, which is such an important part of, you know, of a, a landscape photographer's operation. But it's a very, very difficult thing to do, nonetheless. Admittedly, most of these rely on a sort of romanticism uh, that are inherent, inherent in that type of work. But I think this, for example, works very well, where it's not necessarily just that element that makes it so forceful. Then around, I think, 1980, he started putting up in inner in cities in the same sort of way that he was doing his landscapes. He started working in Sheffield. Which is, which is what I think this is. It's a lovely photograph, this. You see all these pigeons. It's difficult to pick it up on the slide. He did some very strong work around the theme of Durham Coalfields, which is a commission project from the Site Gallery, which is what this is. This is from um, some work he did around the Cotton Valleys around Manchester. I think this is very successful, this photograph, because you've got so many things happening in the scale. You've got the large power station and the details of the football match. And when you see the print, you can read right down into this, you know, almost where the ball is. It's full of information and it just works extremely well as a photograph. So to continue this thesis, perhaps a little bit more continuity, I want to take you through um, some of the work that I've done myself over the last 10 years, 15 years. I'm going to start first off with um, Hebden Bridge, which is a small town in Yorkshire, where I lived for about five years. Now, I was originally brought up in uh, London, classic middle-class home counties kid, and I went up to Manchester to study photography, and I was very much taken with the way in the north of England, uh, people still had a sense of community, there are still traditional values, which I never actually encountered um, in the home counties. There's all the things like Hovis, all the very things, in fact, cobbled streets, cloth caps, all that sort of stuff. All the very things, of course, which one is expected to find in the North, I actually found and liked, and therefore spent quite a bit of time searching out and photographing. So I did a, you know, I spent five years um, around about Hepburn Bridge photographing. These are some of them. And I think very much part and parcel of what I was doing was seeking out these traditional values that I had been denied when I was brought up myself. And I think this is a very important sort of element of, of a lot of what photographers seek. <coughs> if you think about what people, why they go and photograph, where they go and photograph, you'll actually find very often it's the actual opposite to what they are familiar with. In other words, if you live in Glasgow, you go and photograph in the Orkneys. It's that kind of theory, you know, you need something so different to what you're familiar with to actually identify with. And people need to be identified with something, and therefore they can say, this is what I've discovered, <coughs> and these are the values that I want to endorse and uh, uphold. And I think I see quite clearly myself doing this uh, when I was doing this work in Heaven Bridge. Another classic convention that photographers do, and I can say this now because I've done it myself, is to actually photograph things as they're about to die, or as they're about to phase out. And here, for example, you have a, a weaving shed, which is the traditional industry of Hepton Ridge, it used to be called the corduroy town, or the trouser town, because they used to weave corduroy. This is a corduroy uh, factory that's since closed down. And when I was photographing this, I really thought that it was very important that I photograph things 
as they are about to disappear. And I actually think now that that's quite a mistake, and I'm very much going out of my way to put, avoid photographing things as they disappear, because I think it's, it's one of these things where uh, it's a weakness of documentary photography, is that people tend to sort of seek out the life of a lifestyle as it's about to disappear, rather than as it's healthy and um, at its most vibrant. So this is a classic example of that. This is Miss Wild judging the Old Town Cricket Club Baby Competition. <laughs> and this is the classic uh, English-centric thing that we also tend to seek out. <clears throat> Captain Bridge Light Opera Society's version of Oklahoma. I don't want to appear entirely dismissive, dismissive of this work, but I can see uh, certain images that I still like, but I can also see the motivation for what I was doing there be you know, quite suspect in one sense, or just not as solid as when I thought I was doing it. The gamekeeper. I did a whole series on the gamekeepers above the moors in Hampton Bridge. Also, the gamekeepers burning off the heather where the grouse feed. And the actual series that I finally produced about Hampton Bridge was called The Nonconformist. And this picked up on the main theme that I explored, which is the nonconformist chapels and churches of the area. And this is Charlie and Sarah Anna Greenwood, who are two of the stalwarts of Crimson of Dean Methodist Church. And I photographed the activities of the church over a period of about two or three years. And got quite involved with it. This is the chapel anniversary. All right, and around 1979, I began to feel quite claustrophobic about photographing in Hebden Bridge. One reason being that I became so involved with many of the things that I was photographing <coughs> that I thought I was losing sort of a, you know, a sense of uh, subjectivity or objectivity, whatever you want to call it. I was becoming so involved I couldn't really see clearly what was happening, so I thought it was time to sort of try something else. So I picked up on this idea of photographing bad weather, and I thought this is a really interesting idea where it would give me a chance to explore more the language of photography, which is something I was very interested in, because if you do this, the kind of work I was doing previously, it tends to restrict you. And also, I was very interested in the whole idea of being able to put it off anywhere and everywhere, rather than tying myself down to a set place or set time. So this gave me the excuse to go anywhere and photograph, but also to pick up on this idea of um, you know, the way the British are so obsessed by the weather, and to actually turn that round on its head a little bit, to do a project just about bad weather, because traditionally photographers are only meant to go out and photograph when it's sunny, and I just thought it'd be interesting and somewhat uh, masochistic to go out only when it's raining. So these are a few photographs in bad weather. And also you'll notice that um, this is almost very anti-documentary. This is the sort of other part of me coming out, having spent about five years actually pursuing the sort of more documentary uh, elements within my photography, it was time for the other aspects that I have always been there and always present to come out and uh, explore themselves and to get an airing. This is very early in the morning, I'm going to work. You'll notice things like the flash and the rain, uh, were things that I was discovering and got very excited about. In other words, how could you incorporate technique into the photographs to actually make them more articulate about what you're discovering and what you're feeling about things as you discover them. And I'm very interested in the way you can actually make the photographic technique fuse together with what you want to say, rather than just be a device um, that you sort of exploit for the sake of exploiting it. So it's, I think, you know, technique can work very much hand in hand with what you're trying to say, but you, sometimes you actually you can be uh, over technique, or you can make the technique dominate the photograph too much. Sometimes you can make the subject dominate the photograph too much.
must use the that sort of whole way that photography works to the best advantage. Therefore, you must be in control of your technique, making it work for you rather than against you. Something else I became increasingly aware of during this period was the you know starting to doubt some of the um, questions, some of the things I've been referring back to. And one of the things I was particularly keen to do is to try and think of very dull places to go and photograph the bad weather project. So literally, if it was raining, I'd say, where can I go now? What's the dullest place I can go to? And I'd choose things like supermarket car parks, motorway service stations, the very things that documentary photographers weren't expected to go and photograph, and purposely sent myself along to these places just to see if I could get something that's interesting. And this is a subway in Burnley, for example. the car park in Halifax. Another thing that was dawning on me very quickly was how subjective photography was and actually making sure that that whole notion was exploited to the full as well. Uh, you'll notice this photograph here which is taken at the same time as the next one and yet they look entirely different and yet they are the photograph, they're photographed from the same place at the same time yet you couldn't have two more different interpretations of it. They're both equally as valid. In fact, I chose the latter one for the book, but um, I just think it illustrates very effectively how subjective photography is, which is one of the actual things that most people don't think photography is. In 1980, I moved to Ireland for two and a half years, and there I think I finally sort of uh, in one sense, exercise this sort of whole Celtic fringe type, uh, kind of photography that I prefer back to is in myself. I too needed and wanted to go to a place that was quite fringe-like, quite remote, quite beautiful, and uh, Ireland is somewhere I've always been greatly attracted to, and it seemed like a very logical place to sort of finally go out and play that last tune, that last sort of song, and explore it once and for all. And I very much enjoyed doing that as well. The sheep fair. And this is a really classic example of that whole genre. Because then you have racing on the beach, which is something that very rarely happens, and yet it evokes so much. It's, you know, horse racing in itself is very evocative. Race on the beach and then the silhouette. Everything about it is a classic example of that type. I mean, I'd say quite a good one, but nonetheless, it's still a classic example. Paystack auction. But one of the things I was very interested to explore as well uh, was the way that old uh, traditional values in Ireland were very much mixing and mingling with the new values that particularly had come from America. And here you have the uh, Irish traditional horse <coughs> fair being played out in front of the Nevada Burger fast food store. And the whole topography of the West has been very much altered by the growth, spectacular growth of these new bungalows. So that's something else I wanted to look at as well. Now I did this rather quirky series on abandoned Morris miners which in hindsight was certainly the weakest work, but interestingly, the thing that was picked up by most of all from a non-photographic sort of uh, background, like when I was in Ireland, it's the thing that the newspapers picked up on, the magazines picked up on, and uh, again, it's nice to sort of marginalize photography and has it as something quite quirky, unthreatening, and amusing, entertaining, and nothing much more than that. And most of the work that I thought was more interesting that challenged other ideas tended to be uh, more ignored. So moving back from uh, <coughs> Ireland to England, I settled in Liverpool, and uh, I then decided to think about photographing in colour. And that's because I'd become more and more frustrated at the way these photographs that I was producing in black and white tend to be quite neat, quite choreographed, and very contained. And again, if I think of this thing of how does actually what I 
perceive and feel relate to the photographs that I'm actually taking in the same way as I was saying earlier about if you think about your view of Scotland and then you look at the work that's produced and offered about contemporary Scotland, do the two relate? And I would say generally, no, they don't. I was finding the same. So I thought uh, part and parcel of my experience is very much to do with colour and also being affected by the fact that colour photography had been taken seriously, as I say, first in the States and then it crept over here. I thought now's the time you know, to have a go with colour. So I was living very near to this um, seaside resort, which I'd always been attracted to, called New Brighton. So I spent um, three summers, in fact, doing a series of work about New Brighton. And this eventually came out as a book called The Last Resort. So here's one or two pictures from that. Now I get a lot of criticism for this work because people say this is a very voyeuristic set of photographs. It's uh, exploiting the working classes. And uh, this is a problem that you particularly find uh, in Britain. I mean, it's interesting, for example, when I take this work outside of Britain, that same argument never comes up at all. People just don't, it doesn't even enter their heads. But as you know, we're a very class-dominated uh, society in Britain, and therefore it does naturally come up quite a lot here. For me, um, one of the first things I did in the production and presentation of this work was to take away the captions. Again, I think uh, that's quite significant. And also, I think uh, there's a lot of very personal things that uh, were going on in my mind. For example, uh, Susie, who I'm married to, we were deciding whether to have a baby or not at the time of shooting these photographs, which is why there are a lot of babies in the photographs, because it seemed to me, you know, having thinking about this problem quite a lot, it's a classic, you know, yuppie teenage couple decision to have to make. And we were going through those classic sort of turmoils. It seemed to me that babies, you know, I photographed a lot of babies. And also, it seemed to me that they illustrated quite well the sort of state of play of society in general, which is one of the things that I'm referring to in these photographs. So it's all mingled in together, but uh, I'm having to say these things because so often this sort of work can be misinterpreted and misunderstood in terms of it just being, uh, you know, an essay or a treatise on the working class of Britain. Most of these photographs were taken with uh, fill-in flash, and um, ever since doing the Bad Weather Project, I became a real flash addict, because I like the fact that it makes things look a bit different, it makes things look a bit surreal, and that's all very much part and parcel of what I'm trying to emphasize, is my own particular personal viewpoint. So I use the device like that to try and make sure that that is quite clearly understood and quite clearly comes across. And also, I like the garish quality that the flash and the colour gave. It seemed to me to be highly appropriate to uh, looking at work you know, in, a, in a seaside resort. Here's the cover of the book. And uh, I published this book myself, as I did with the previous book. And uh, this seemed to me like a logical step forward because I'm most happy when my work is presented in book form uh, I prefer it to exhibitions because I think it's very good to sort of sit down with a photographic book and leaf through it, assuming the reproduction is, is up to standard. It's really what I actually think of as being the ultimate vehicle for the work. And uh, by self-publishing it means you can keep control over the design, you can keep control over what goes in it, of course, who writes about it, who writes in it, all the things that I in my estimation, are extremely important decisions that a photographer should make for his or herself. And uh, it seemed crazy to actually hand over, even if you could persuade uh, another commercial publisher to, to do your book, to hand over those very important decisions to someone else. For example, in this book cover here, most photographic books have a photograph on the front, you know, nice and neatly in the middle. Most of the two previous books that I've done before have done followed that exact convention. So I was very interested to see if we can get away from that. And uh, therefore, you know, it's quite a different cover for a photographic book. And I know if I'd taken it to Thames and Hudson, and if they had taken it on, which would have been very unlikely, they'd have probably insisted that there was a nice, neat color photograph in the middle of the cover. So it seemed to me like the final sort of thing you must do to sort of follow through your work to getting it out to the, the small public who is actually interested in it.
this is um, some work that I did from the Commission last year, and generally speaking, I think commissions in this country have problems attached to them, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but this is one of the few commissions that I've actually did that uh, seemed to me to be quite successful. And together with someone called the Documentary Photography Archive, uh, the brief that we set ourselves was to look at and examine shopping in the, uh, in the 80s. So the exhibition was called The Point of Sale, and we started off looking at very traditional aspects for shopping, like this hairdressers, and going right the way through to hype markets, including the way people um, sell things in their own homes. So even though this set were actually looked at something which is a social phenomenon, I was able to actually do so in a very personal way. And I like the idea of combining those two elements. This is Marks and Spencer's. May I recognize? MS. I was very pleased that there's a lot of broccoli in the middle there. The broccoli seems to me to be a very 80s vegetable. <laughs> this is um, a hypermarket, Tesco's hypermarket in Salford. Frozen food shop, Black Forest Ghetto. Did you know the favourite meal of the um, British public is uh, prawn cocktail, followed by steak and chips and Black Forest Ghetto? It used to be Yorkshire um, pudding and beef. It's been superseded by that. So I find it very interesting to actually try and uh, explore a theme that's so familiar and because it's so familiar, it's not actually as um, full of the cliches that perhaps dwell on things that uh, are less sort of everyday, like working class culture in the north of England, or um, culture, Celtic fringe culture in the outlying islands of Scotland. It, it's ironic that something so familiar is actually less cliche ridden, and therefore there's much more scope to in investigate and explore rather than actually just try and illustrate what one already has sort of, you know, clanging away in the back of one's own conscience. This, for example, is a free bus laid on by Tesco's, even though it's quick save soup bags there, uh, to take people out to um, outlying council estates to shop people into the hypermarket to get more customers in. And they lay these buses on on the quieter days, like Monday, Wednesday, Tuesday, Thursday, not Friday or Saturday, and uh, it's one way of increasing their turnover. This is a uh, Tupperware party. It's just remarkable how much Tupperware has actually shifted in a party like this. <coughs> Could say not more than a dozen people, because it's a party and because someone's gone to a lot of trouble to lay on a bit of drink and sandwiches and a few cakes, people really do feel intimidated by. It. Uh, it's quite remarkable to witness. I was actually given some Tupperware that night. I didn't have to do it by it myself, <laughs> which I keep my film fresh in. shopping. This, in fact, this shop here was done after the commission. It's, it's a subject that I will, uh, I think shopping and consumerism is something that I will always come back to time and time again. So it's like an ongoing thing. Christmas shopping. These are just a few photographs from Ireland, and it's interesting to look at these. Um, and compare them to the work that I did when I was actually living there, because in the, say, four or five years, no, four years since I came back from Ireland, uh, my views have changed quite dramatically, and I've been trying to explain that as I go along. And when the opportunity came to work on a book about Ireland, uh, I think two summers ago, I was very interested in the idea of going back there and reshooting more stuff and seeing how differently it came out. 
and indeed using colour rather than black and white. This is in Dublin. Now, I'm just going to show now a few photographs from China, because I think this illustrates a few points that I'd like to make. And uh, I had this opportunity to go to China in um, you know, 84, 85. Uh, there was an exhibition called British Photographic Art, <coughs> something called the Great Britain China Centre, and put together. And uh, two other photographers and myself were invited to go over. And normally when I go abroad, I don't take photographs, because I actually find that uh, it's a great distraction. And because I don't know much about the places I'm actually photographing in, I feel I can't really respond to it uh, in the way that I'd like to through my photographs. But for some reason, because the China trip came along, I thought it was too good an opportunity to miss. It's really like a sense of weakness. And I found myself um, shooting stuff in the way that one expects photographs in China to be seen. As you know, the big story now at the moment is the whole way that China is becoming westernized and is being influenced by the West. And I found myself sort of almost looking out for photographs and actually confirmed that before I had actually experienced it myself. I and mean, although to a certain extent it's true, it's just a very good example of how what you expect the subject to produce, you actually look for and identify and seek out when you actually get there to confirm the prejudices that you already have. Now in my estimation, that is really the crux of what's wrong with uh, British documentary photography today and the thing that I'm trying to fight but it's so easy, one can find, to actually slip back into that. And especially when you get into territory which is unfamiliar, you find yourself doing this. So in this sense, I just show you these few slides just to illustrate that and to show you how, you know, because you're shooting in unfamiliar circumstances, you actually slip back to what you already know in the back of your mind rather than actually thrust yourself forward and explore for yourself as much as you should do. This is in a factory, and you notice the one parent, uh, you know, the one child family poster in the background there. It's in a textile factory. And this is a big new lavish hotel, which is um, sprouting in, uh, this is in Canton, which is a very big city just north of Hong Kong, and has enormous uh, tourist trade there. And these, ho these new hotels are quite astonishing. I mean, actually, they're sightseeing sites for the local Chinese, not the, the new middle-class Chinese, not the, the peasant workers. And people come in and have their photograph taken inside a hotel, which I found quite bizarre. Peking Station. The stampede to get to goods in the department stores in Shanghai is quite remarkable to watch. But again, very much part of this whole ex expected notion of what we find in China. Western jeans. Pool. So I think this very much, you know, thinking about this whole sort of mechanism and the whole approach very much confirms my belief that uh, if you really want to sort of shed some light on the subject, you have to know it very well inside anyway, and have to actually be able to break down the expectations of it. This is in the Forbidden City, and people have their photograph taken in this car or on a motorbike. I mean, it's absolutely bizarre. A lot of families in China still wouldn't be able to afford cameras, therefore they rely very much on the high street photographer or the seaside photographer or the tourist photographer in the way that people in Britain did, say, 50 years ago. <coughs> so, on my return from China, um, there was an open commission being advertised in uh, Liverpool and Manchester called The Connections, and I found myself, without even really thinking perhaps, actually applying to do a commission about um, Chinatown in Liverpool and Manchester, because that was the whole idea of the project. And I think this also illustrates how uh, you actually find a photographic uh, 
galleries in this country very much uphold this sort of general sort of treatise that I've trained trying to explain. And in one sense, uh, I knew this would be very much a classic kind of commissioned um, sort of accepted project. It's a classic commissioned show to actually do something about an ethnic minority in uh, northern England today, Liverpool and Manchester, very much to show how Liverpool is going down, Manchester is going up. And all those sort of things added up together to make it into sort of a package that um, you know, the gallery would find very difficult to turn down because there's quite tight competition, but they want to rely back on something that they know is going to be the acceptable package for a commission. And since then, because I didn't particularly like the work that I did for this commission, I've decided that it's probably best to avoid going forward because it actually probably uh, just further sort of exploits this very thing that I've been talking about. And I think it's something worthy of avoiding, if you possibly can, because I do think that, um, in a sense, the photographic establishment, as well as the photographers, you know, are equally as at fault in the, what the work they've been um, uh, showing and how they've been promoting it. And because we're so narrative-based in this country, it's much easier to show and promote a project that's about a theme that's noble and all those sort of things that I've been talking about earlier than to something that's much more difficult and personal to understand. So when I was doing this commission, and I'll show you a few of these very quickly, the first thing I thought I'd do was to look at the docks in um, Liverpool, which still has Chinese boats coming into it. So it's very strange actually going onto a Chinese boat in Liverpool, because it's just like being in China, except you don't have all the jet lag. And it really was quite, you know, very nice to go back to China, but without actually having to go physically back. So it's only the first officer, by law it's interesting, only the first officer is obliged to speak English um, in the maritime world. So once I talked to him, got his permission, I was just wandering around the boat, and virtually no one else spoke English. And I just say, to walk, for example, into this seaman's cabin with no English between them, you know, they have no English, and just start throwing up, and they're quite happy for me to do that. This is on the boat, cooking the dinner. This is in Chinatown in Liverpool. One thing I tried, not very successfully, to illustrate was the feeling of alienation I think any ethnic minority must feel in this country. <coughs> Definitely because I wasn't a Chinese person, I wasn't really able to th throw any light on that, but just the light that one expects to be thrown. But this photograph perhaps uh, you know, works better than some of them, but it didn't quite work. But you can see the kind of goals that I was having, which I wasn't able to do because I didn't have the time or the contacts within the Chinese community to fully you know, to carry it out totally. And because fundamentally I wasn't Chinese, and that was the thing that counts. I was also interested in trying to find um, people in Liverpool and Manchester who are actually earning a living from the Chinese community but not doing anything connected with the uh, food industry or the takeaway industry or the restaurant business, which is unquestionably the main support, you know, support of income for the Chinese community. So it's good to find something like a Chinese dentist and photograph here. But you see here, the photograph, for example, that last photograph, wasn't, it's, it's not a very good photograph at all. I mean, it's positively weak. But because you get hooked into this narrative, you feel that there's a place for it, when really, visually, it's a sort of complete non-starter. So if I'd have had, uh, you know, my own sort of intuitive feelings towards this, I wouldn't have been included in the exhibition. But because of myself being trained to think in a particular type of way or expect it to, it has a place because it makes a point. This is a Chinese takeaway at about half eleven at night when the pubs were open, um, closing in Manchester. It was quite <coughs> an amazing scene. And uh, they were just so rude to this Chinese couple, I've never heard blatant racism this directly. I was quite shocked. And when I said to them after the session was over, what did you think about tonight? They said it was just perfectly normal. It happens every night. I could not really believe it. I was uh, quite disgusted. This is interesting in the sense that um, when the 
gallery in Manchester asked me for press prints for the exhibition, I sent them the two photographs that I thought best illustrated um, what I was trying to achieve, although a bit shakily within this project. And I then sent them some more for use in magazines, but said quite explicitly these are the two to be used by um, for, for the press release. And then I finally actually used this photograph in the press release because it's very much a sort of very positive, upbeat photograph, exactly what one expects again. And I was so furious that they um, actually used this one against my wishes and also doing all, undoing a little bit of good that or a little bit of progress that I actually made in shooting this project and actually taking it right back to square one. And it's probably this actually happening that decided me to you know, not to actually make those mistakes again. You know, I've just done it, and the best way to avoid it is just to not go in for these things unless you very clearly have your own ideas and your own sort of criteria established well beforehand. This is one I quite like. They had this inaugural flight from Manchester, which is becoming a very big Chinese uh, community and quite an important one, to Hong Kong, from Manchester Airport. And they got uh, Colin Marshall, up, the chief executive of British Airways. <coughs> and whenever there's a Chinese event and they want to get press attention, they always drag out Chinese dragon and uh, get to dance around and then pack from Manchester the news comes along and takes a photograph. This is what I was trying to illustrate here. And this is someone actually getting the flight, this inaugural flight. <coughs> right, so what of the future? I've just got a few slides now. And in about 10 days' time, I'm actually going to be moving from Liverpool to Bristol because I've now decided that the thing that I want to particularly concentrate on is to photograph middle-class England. And although you can actually find that in Liverpool, it's not really as, uh, it's a bit thin on the ground. And so therefore I decided to move to Bristol to give me the opportunity to photograph in a you know, very, quite a relatively prosperous city, uh, with a lot of trendy young couple people like myself in. And it's particularly that kind of thing that I'm gonna be interested in exploring in the future. And uh, even though I don't know exactly how the work will turn out, I just have a, quite a clear idea of some of the things that I wish to explore through photography and through the kind of lifestyle that I'm going to be leading down there. And they're very much intermingled in with itself. And it's sort of becoming more and more personal, less and less sort of documentary, which is what I've been trying to explain all night. And I don't know how it's going to go. I'm quite uncertain, but I know many of the things that I won't be doing. And some of the things that I'm going to be doing is exploring the way um, for example, middle class people are much more aware of being photographed. And this perhaps, I don't know if it works yet because it's so recently taken. This is done in Laura Ashley. And you can see here the woman quite uh, aware of me photographing her and quite clearly not totally approving of that because I didn't ask permission and all those things. And I'm very interested <coughs> to see if you can actually illustrate many of the other things that I'm hoping to explore by the relationship between the photographer and the subject. So this is just a whole new area that I want to explore in the future. But it's going to take quite a long time, I think, to um, clarify my ideas about this. This is at a crafts fair. I really don't like crafts fairs, which is why I photograph in them. Because I'm going to be photographing some things that I really like doing, like going to openings, and some things that I really would never do, but feel like must photograph because they are so sort of bleh, like craft fairs. As I mentioned earlier, we were thinking about having a baby, and we've since had a baby, and this is a, is a recent National Childbirth Trust, which we joined coffee morning. So it could easily be sort of me holding the baby or my wife holding the baby, looking out onto the urban scene outside. Good, solid, reliable Britain. I think one of the things that I'm most interested in 
is the whole way in which so many aspects of contemporary life are, are about things like selfishness. And uh, I feel that, you know, since I've been sort of aware of what's happening in Britain, I find it going more and more alarmingly selfish, uh, especially the middle class uh, sort of community, especially down in the south. And in one sense, that's one of the things that I'm looking to actually try and put my finger on. It's going to be a very difficult thing to, to do, but I'm just trying to explain you know, the direction which I may be going in the future. And I think that's probably it. So, thank you very much. You said you're being accused of exploiting the working class in your last resort. Um, were you being accused by working class people or was it middle class people? Middle class people. But accusing it's quite interesting that you mention that because the, the exhibition was first shown in um, Liverpool and Birkenhead, which is where the which is the area where people come and visit every bright of the day. And people didn't mention it then because they know that's what you write is like. Well as if you take those photographs say down to London in particular. You know, or you take them to an art school over in, you know, Sheffield. That's the sort of question that you always get. And I don't know, I think that's quite interesting, and you can draw your own conclusions from that, but uh, certainly people locally don't know, that's just what New Brighton's like, you know. <laughs> and then, um, would you have the middle class would be a lot harder for you? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah. And what would you think of it's probably be more difficult to get access because uh, middle class people are very wary of having topics around, while as working class people don't seem to be as um, problematic about that. And, you know, it'd be more difficult because in New Brighton there is, you know, you go there on Sunday and there it is all happening. Many of the things that I want to photograph in this new project will be things that happen in people's houses as well as being out in the open, like garden centres, golf, squash, Sunday lunchtime drinking, all those sort of things. But uh, it will be more difficult because it will mean getting access into certain, you know, to people's private lives. Yes, there's a lot of cases where there's membership involved in. Yes, I mean, right. I mean, I, I have done and got access into things like that before, and it can be done, but uh, it will be more difficult, I imagine. Do you think that will let you work as a perhaps as deeply as you did with the last resort. I hope so, yeah. I mean, I fully intend to. Uh, I mean, I don't imagine it'll be three, four years before I'll actually be ready to put out any work on this particular subject. I should be doing other things in between time. Otherwise, you know, I, I would entirely dry up. But uh, I imagine it will be very difficult and will take a long time. You answered you that absolutely uh, discussion uh, by saying that, you know, Britain's becoming, well, you believe it's becoming more selfish, I agree with you entirely, and you said that's particularly prevalent in the middle classes. Do you not think, therefore, you're going down to Bristol with a bit of a prejudice and you're going to go into a squash club and sort of reinforce that prejudice? It's inevitable. I mean, you cannot get away from the you fact that we have... You yourself, though. But Sorry? But well, I mean, I, one, of, one of the things that I find amusing and I find challenging is that all these things I say, I direct it myself. If I'm saying I think Britain's getting more selfish, what I'm actually telling you is I feel I can see quite clearly how I'm getting selfish too, right? So I'm interested in exploring these whole ideas because I think rather than actually try and hide away from them, one thing that photography and one thing that any creative medium can do is give you an opportunity to explore them. For example, when we were talking about discussing having a baby, you as I was actually able to, you know, transmit that out into the work and actually explore it while I was photographing at the same time as thinking about it. So, I mean, I agree that inevitably I'm being a hypocrite, but I think it's more interesting to admit to being a hypocrite and admit to these things and try, therefore, to explore them than actually to, uh, you know, sweep over the carpet. Of them. But, I mean, I take your point, and I, it's one I entirely endorse. No, I know, but it's, it's, it's an interesting point. And you yeah. built it up really nicely. To destroy yourself. Yeah. I mean, this is why many of the things I've said tonight appear to be quite confused, and which I explained at the beginning. And uh, I mean, I don't even know what it what it sounded like because I didn't hear it. But I am just trying to explain 
you know, the workings of, you know, what I'm actually trying to thrash my way through. But do you not think that, that the whole thing about uh, people trying to reinforce their prejudices, like uh, people who, uh, I don't know, left-wing people supposedly read a left-wing paper like The Guardian, mm -hmm. uh, and yet you'll get sort of, um, I don't know, more right-wing people reading the uh, Daily Telegraph than mm -hmm. the Daily Express. I mean, people do that anyway, you know, photographers included, so... Yeah. yeah. I agree, I agree. What can we do about it, right? Any ideas? Uh, world revolution to watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who wants to sign on now? <laughs> How do you feel people are going to react to uh, photographs of the people that go to the openings, seeing um, mirror images displayed before them? Do you do you do you envisage the people being um, you know, wanting identifying with it? I or, or do people no like idea. seeing the old? Uh, yeah, you know? I mean, I actually really do have no idea as yet until it starts to happen a bit more concretely. But, I mean, I would never shy away from showing the people that I've photographed, um, you know, the photographs back to those people, whoever it has been or in the past, and I won't do that again in the future. I'm always very interested to get the reaction of the people who actually featured the photographs to the photographs. What's going to happen when people say, I don't want you to show those photographs? Uh, I don't know. I haven't even... The case with the, it's the quite project. likely that... Um, I would actually have to uh, go along with that wish. Um, but that's a very interesting problem, and that hasn't arisen directly yet. And it's one that I'm much more likely to encounter in the future than I have done in the past. And in a sense, I have no idea what will happen. I'll just have to um, handle it when, it when it occurs. You said that your work was becoming more personal. Do you think that the more personal it gets, the more inaccessible it gets? Inaccessible. Yeah, or the more, do you think it'll become, the, the degree of, per, of personalness that it acquires, will that make it more accessible or more inaccessible? Do I think it will make it inaccessible? What do you think? It will get more more accessible? Or not? <laughs> I don't, um, I don't know. I, I don't think, um, for example, the new Brighton work, which is one of the things I've done recently, has been the most, uh, even though it's been the most controversial, it's been the most successful set of photographs I've ever done. It's certainly, uh, you know, it's had more attention than any other set that I've produced. And I'm very interested in actually combining. I don't want to take photographs that are inaccessible. Although I do think that um, inevitably, this next set of photographs will cater much more for a British audience who's going to understand, you know, the complexities, because I imagine it to be quite a complex set of photographs <coughs> that are illustrated by than perhaps uh, a European or American audience while as the, the direct appeal of, say, the New Brighton work can be seen you know, through you know, Europe or America and can be directly appreciated. And of course, perhaps one reason why, for example, it's been very popular in Europe is because, generally speaking, the Europeans don't like the Brits, and therefore to see the Brits looking in a positive state of decline, actually quite, they find quite endearing, and therefore it's been very popular abroad. You know, because again, they have their um, you know, prejudiced views of what the Brits like and to actually uh, you know, have a good chuckle of them in a down position suits their prejudices quite well. But uh, I don't know exactly the answer to that. I mean, I, I'm very aware that I want to always make my work accessible but also work on many different levels. So um, I shall make pretty certain that, the, that they are reasonable photographs before I do anything with them. And when I say a reasonable photograph, I mean one that has you know, an instant visual sort of appeal, and whether it's got other subtleties or underlying forces in it, then so be it. I'm very happy to have that, but you know, I don't want to produce boring photographs, because I don't think you know, the world is boring. Any more questions, comments? Yeah, I was wondering if, well, firstly, do you call yourself a documenter? Um, do I? Are you asking me or are you saying that? Yeah, a quick answer because I've got one or two other small points to make. No, I'm just a photographer now. Yeah. And how important do you think the um, 
sort of linguistic medium surrounding your work as you referred to earlier on, how important do you think that is? The linguistic medium? You mean talking about yeah, if oral it, If people are sitting talking or... about visual images. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How important do I think that is? Yeah. Well, it's important, but it's different. Uh, I mean, I think in terms of Britain, there's much, I mean, if you think of the state of current, say, theatre or current uh, theatre production, contemporary theatre production, I think it's much more advanced than the, the state generally of, of photography. I mean, I think we're much more advanced in terms of the lit literacy within that medium. I mean, I think photography's got problems because it's only really in the last 20 years that we've had the Renaissance, and in fact, we've basically had to start all over again. And therefore, 20 years long for a medium to really get to know itself and to get to understand what's happening within it, how it works within society. I'm just struck by the difference between sort of uh, some form of uh, photographic documentary and, and the, the film situation, in which there's a running commentary and everything's laid out. But, I mean, you can, get, you can get many different types of film documentary. I mean, I think they're entirely different with other sets of problems, other sets of conventions within that. But you get some people have film documentary, TV documentary, where they don't narrate over. Some people do the narration. I mean, I, I would probably gear away from the, the narration over, because that tends to sort of tie everything up into a nice little package, which I don't think most subjects can... Uh, you know, I don't think it's a good treatment for most subjects because it's not quite as simple as people want to make it out to be. I don't know if I'm answering your... your I'm not, I don't know if I'm... Am I answering your... Yes. Where is? Yeah, it seems to make sense. <laughs> what aspect of... If your work is, get, is getting more personal, so what aspect of your personality do you think is represented by the fact that you're becoming middle class? And well, I've yeah, not I mean, become I've, middle class, no, I've always been middle class. Yeah, but now you, you, you've become, you, your roots have been in middle classness, and now you're really settling down in it with a child and a family. Yeah, I know, again, it's um, classic yeah, stuff, you see. Yeah, I mean, what, I, what aspect of your personality, then, is that saying, if your work is becoming more personal, you're going into a middle class area, and you're um, photographing middle class nests, Mm -hmm. So is that like a defence? It's like a defence mechanism saying, I realise what is wrong. Yeah, I can see what's happening to me. And uh, I feel it's never <coughs> that I'm sort of cautious of it. But, I mean, I suppose there's a streak in me that's this like anarchistic streak that always wants to subvert the things that I've taken for granted or that other people take for granted. So I suppose I'm questioning my own existence, my own lifestyle, examining it and uh, exploring it, really. And... Uh, at the moment, I'm interested in the whole idea of the two fusing together even more closely than I, they have done in the past. And I find that a very interesting um, prospect, and it intrigues me immensely. But, I mean, rather than actually, you know, I'm now going to try and exploit the fact that I'm from the middle class factor, and rather than try and maybe hide away from it, you know, I'm really going to um, exploit that to the absolute full. So perhaps that's one of the things that I've uh, recognised of late. And of course it is all to do with the problems that we have in perceiving class in this country. It is a very class dominated society, you cannot get away from it. And I'm just interested in exploring that as well, really.